All right. Okay, then. Okay. So, hello. Thank you all. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of CSS Conf Budapest. Um, just massive thanks to the organizers, and most importantly, you all for welcoming me into your ridiculously beautiful and picturesque city. Um, my name is Jeremy Wagner, and I'm a web performance consultant for Site Improve. Uh, my job is to do all I can to make the web faster for our clients, and I also write and talk about performance a bit. I'm just repeating everything uh, that our wonderful MC has already said. Uh, <laughs> but this talk is about paint worklets, which is a little weird for me because I always talk about performance, uh, which has comparably little to do performance. Well, mostly, we'll get there. Um, and right about now, you might be wondering, oh, Jeremy, what the hell are paint worklets? And it's a good question. And since I don't want to assume everyone knows about this, here's a quick tour of what they are and what they can do. Paint worklets are part of a developing spe uh, set of specifications called Houdini. And with the APIs Houdini provides, you can write what are, uh, what are called worklets. Uh, and they let you develop expressive and stateful animations, custom layout modes even. Hmm, that's a developing thing. And as is the sole focus of this talk, generative artwork using the CSS Paint API. Seriously. So I haven't answered your question yet. And out there, you're thinking, OK, fine, Jeremy. Fine, not whatever. But what even is a worklet? Will you get to the point? Worklets are similar to web workers, but unlike web workers, worklets offer developers lower level access to rendering pipelines for completing very narrowly defined but super specific tasks. And in the case of paint worklets, we're talking about artwork that we can generate with JavaScript and control with CSS. Now, I know JSConf is tomorrow and not today. So you're probably thinking, well, what, what the hell is this? I didn't ask for no JavaScript at a CSS conf. Boo. And I feel you. Uh, as much as I love JavaScript, the web can sometimes feel like this. Um, but I feel that this technology is relevant here even at CSS conf, because even if you're not a JavaScript devotee or super fan, you can still use paint worklets, which have already been written in your designs, without ever having to do more than write a little CSS here or there. So they're still relevant to you. Uh, and this is possible because while paint worklets are written in JavaScript, they're embeddable in CSS. And this is what I mean by embeddable. When you look at this lonely background image property, you might be thinking, well, that's not right. Isn't background image supposed to take a URL? Well, that's certainly the prevailing use case. But in browsers that support paint worklets, the background image property can also take this little nifty paint syntax, too. So if you think of the URL syntax in CSS as a function that accepts a URL string to an image, you can similarly think of paint as a function which accepts a string that represents and invokes a paint worklet. And in that worklet is where you write the JavaScript to generate background images that CSS can use. So in this example, we're calling paint to invoke a worklet that is registered under the name amazing. But until we actually register a worklet to that name, this bit of CSS won't do anything and therefore will not be very amazing. And this is what that registration process looks like, which is done in JavaScript on your page or your main app code that runs on the main thread. Because the paint API isn't available in all browsers, you'll need to do a quick check to see if window.css.paintworklet is a thing that you can use. And if it is, you can then use its add module method to load your worklet from a separate JavaScript file. And what is a paint work worklet, really? I mean, what is it? It turns out it's a class with a predetermined shape, which consists of a method called, well, paint. And with that, within that method is where all the code that draws the artwork goes. And the shape of a paint worklet is not restrictive at all. So you're free to use other class features to organize and, and do like whatever to organize your drawing code any way that you prefer. And that's nifty, because without a little organization, uh, your drawing code can start to look like this. Um, and we really don't want that, do we? Then, uh, moving on, in the same file after and outside of your paint worklet class, you can call register paint, which requires two arguments. The first is the name, the string name, uh, that the paint worklet should be registered under. 
and then the second, um, this, that allows it to be accessed by the paint function, and then the second is the reference to the class that you just wrote that does all of the painting. And when this all comes together, a paint worklet finally becomes usable by CSS. But how do we draw stuff? What does that even look like? Huh? Well, the API you use conveniently to draw stuff is really just the Canvas API's 2D drawing context, something that's been around for a very long time that some of us have good familiarity with. And that makes sense. Why, why develop a separate API for drawing in 2D when a perfectly good one is like right there, you know? The second argument is the Canvas geometry, which offers the dimensions of the drawing space. And this is essential uh, to ensuring your artwork responds to the available space. Because, you know, your elements can kind of shift and change size, that sort of thing happens. And in this madly responsive world that we live in, we want to make sure that our artwork adapts to the container that it's in. So here's an example of a minimally viable paint method which draws a solid black circle with a 64 pixel radius smack dab in the middle of the canvas, no matter what the size of that canvas is. And so if we assume this super basic paint worklet gets registered under the not at all ironic name of amazing and we apply it to an element, we'll get this, this totally amazing thing that in no way could be replaced by a static image whatsoever. So this might be you right about now. But that simplistic example was meant to illustrate how we get from one line of CSS to something that lets you generate background images using a familiar API. There is so much more that this technology is capable of, so let's take a look at it and just think, what if you could use this API to create randomly generated artwork that could enhance your designs in practical yet spontaneous ways that are just a little bit different, a little bit of chaos, right? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the other important aspects of this technology as well. So when we're done here, the only thing that will be able to cage your creativity is you. So let's see what's possible with this expressive and cool technology. But still, and um, I sense a little bit of uh, hesitancy, uh, knowing where or just how to start can be kind of paralyzing. So it's a good frame of mind to, to you know, a good frame of mind to get into is to think of the canvas as like a set of tiles, where all the tiles are separate, but potentially overlapping or connected pieces which are randomly generated. This mindset trains your focus uh, conveniently only on what to do in each tile rather than allowing yourself to be overwhelmed by what to do with the entire space. And once everything is done, you can kind of step back and just see how all these things connect and interlock and how they come together. And this helps us reach where I think is the sweet spot with the Paint API, we can get weird, yes, uh, but that weirdness can intersect with what's practical and therefore usable. And that, to me, is like the magical part of web development, the weirdly practical stuff. Now, some of what you're going to see here, and I, I feel obliged to call this out, is uh, very much inspired by a wonderful talk that Tim Holman gave at JSConf AU last year, where he talked about generative art using the Canvas API. I highly recommend you check it out on YouTube because he is way better at this stuff than I am. And pretty much everything in that talk is something that you will then be able to apply to paint worklets in the CSS Paint API. So do check it out. OK, let's revisit that paint method in the amazing uh, paint worklet class and just maybe change things up a little bit. There's more going on in this example than when we were just drawing this mundane, lonely circle in the middle of a bleak canvas. So first, we establish the size of each tile, which will be 32 pixels square. Uh, then we divide the canvas's width and height by the tile size. And then we'll write two loops using those values to draw each individual tile. The first loop deals with tiles on the y-axis. And then the second loop deals with, unsurprisingly, tiles on the x-axis. And the second loop is nested inside of the first one. And this will end up populating, or allow us to populate, every tile available on the canvas with whatever it is we feel like drawing. So what you do uh, uh, here is up to you. But in this example, I'm going to draw a line in every tile, but the random part of it, of it will be where the line goes in, in the tile space, right? So in every iteration, I call the context object's begin path method to begin drawing a line. And then I leave it to math.random, or math.pseudorandom, am I right, uh, to decide if the line will cross the tile space from the upper left corner 
to the lower lower right corner or draw a line straight line from the upper left corner to the lower left corner. And after that, I finish up the uh, iteration by telling the context object to draw the stroke. So what does that look like? Turns out it looks like a kind of cool thing that changes every single time. And that is the kind of spontaneity and randomness I'm talking about here. And that's just what you can do if you only know like just a teeny little bit of the, of the Canvas API. But with a little ingenuity, that little teeny bit of ingenuity can go extremely far. Like, what if we just decided to throw in a little something extra and randomly decide whether or not to draw a dot in the upper left-hand corner of each tile? This gives the final artwork a sort of circuit board appearance, which I think is kind of neat. And we can also make the tile size a bit bigger, and we can change the color. And because a canvas background is transparent by default, we can specify a CSS background color property to set, the, to set this artwork on whatever color it is we want. So I've kind of done like this off black grayish thing. Now imagine this pattern in a page's masthead background, but maybe at a more subtle and lower opacity that just gives the design just a little bit of extra oomph and like chaos, but without overpowering the foreground and like making things like, you know, just kind of subtle, like, you know, being cool. Uh, so that was cool, but let's do a different take on this idea and let's like, let's experiment a little bit more. Like what else can we do? So here's a paintwork I call Blotto. Uh, which draws circles of varying size and opacity in every tile, like kind of an ink blot kind of thing. And so there's a bit of code here, so let's just walk through it. At the very beginning, uh, uh, beginning of Blotto's paint method, we set some variables. Uh, the tile size, of course, uh, 8 by 8 pixels, and then we define this amplitude variable, which aids us in sort of generating randomly sized circles later on and then we calculate the number of tiles on both axes, and then we store the result of pi times two, which means that the circle that we draw will be a full circle uh, at 360 degrees. And then finally, we set the fill style to this sort of like nice little blue. And now here's where we do the heavy lifting. You'll note that the loops are the same as with the circuit board pattern, um, and we, we do all the work inside of the second nested loop. Now, where it changes is that we generate a random alpha value by getting the remainder of math.random divided against itself, and this will get us a valid transparency value from 0 to 1.0. And then we multiply the tile size by math.random and our amplitude value from earlier, and now all we do from here is just draw a circle with that information that we've just sort of come up with. And then we register good old blotto here like this, just like usual, and then we can use it in CSS like so. And because paint worklets draw, like I said, they draw on a transparent background by default. We can add a, a nice little background color to sit, uh, for it to sit on. I've chosen this sort of like off-white. And so after all of that faffing about, um, what does it look like? Pretty cool. I think it's not bad if I do say so myself. I mean, I don't think anything I do is cool, but I think that's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> and as before, we get a unique result every time the canvas redraws, and it gives us, again, that organic feel that, while stable and familiar, is just slightly chaotic and spontaneous, and I really like that. Every single time it draws. Okay, so that was cool, right? Uh, but let's think outside of tiles, right? Tiles are fun, and they're convenient ways to draw, like generative artwork, uh, but let's, like, step into the world of trigonometry. And I'm sure most of you are pretty comfortable with trig, but if not, don't worry. Uh, it's, it's not too hard, and I never was a good math student, so like I was brushing up on my trig last week. <laughs> uh, here's another paint worklet I call flashy, which randomly draws stylized rays of light, um, sorry, uh, around a circle, which flare outward, which makes it sort of look like a stylized rendering of the sun, which I think is kind of cool. So let's look at the paint method. And as before, we'll need to establish variables that we can use later. The first is the radius of the main circle that the rays will radiate from. Think like the sun itself, which we've set at 48 pixels. Um, next is the amount of deviation of each ray's width. And this is what we use to make it look like the rays are flaring outward as they extend from the sun itself out to the edge of the canvas. And next is the outer radius, which is sort of think like a giant uh, circle uh, around the entire canvas that you don't see, uh, we do this uh, so that we ensure that the edges of the rays will be drawn outside of the canvas bounds when we use our trigonometry functions to plot where those rays need to go. And finally, we have the x and y coordinates from which the circle, the main circle, uh, will be drawn. Um, 
and we calculate um, the position of this thing by multiplying the width and height of the canvas's size by some static values to sort of ensure it sits proportionately somewhere in the upper left, but if the element size changes, it'll kind of adjust a little bit. Um, and now it's time to get drawing. So first, we set the fill color, and then we draw the circle from which the rays will radiate. Pretty straightforward. Now here's where it gets a little interesting, and um, this code will all be available, so if you can't totally read it, that's okay. Um, it will be available somewhere. Because we are drawing rays radiating around a circle, we'll want to do one for loop that starts at zero degrees and then goes all the way around to 360, and then in each iteration, we'll let math.random decide if it wants to draw anything at all. And if it decides, okay, we're going to do that, we'll calculate the x and y coordinates at the edge of the larger circle that exists outside the canvas bounds. And so then we do this by converting the edge of each ray from degrees, represented by our incrementer i, uh, to radians. And from there, we'll then draw this polyline shape that uses a trigonometry, like two trigonometry functions, to figure out the x and y coordinates to draw the lines for each ray. Once the shape is drawn, we fill it with the same solid color as we used with the circle. And then, like before, we register that flashy little fella. And then, like before, we use it in the CSS like this and give it a nice pinkish background color to sit on. And what do you think that looks like? Something pretty cool, I think, right? It looks kind of neat, and a little bit of math goes a long way into making this look really cool and stylish. And like before, we still get that spontaneity that gives it that uh, familiar but slightly different appearance each and every time that it draws. So, and as an aside, <coughs> I sucked at math in school, like, <laughs> like barely scraped by through Algebra 2 sucked. So if I can make stuff like this, pretty much anyone can make stuff that looks really cool with just a little bit of like, you know, or even just some basic arithmetic can help you make some really cool stuff in this. And so, case in point, like this paint work that I like to call Slapdash. This one is kind of one of the easier ones to make, and I use it on my website currently. Although it might not be long for this world, I'm kind of getting tired of it. Uh, but that's okay. Like, because I've got some others up my sleeve, like this one, which I like to call Bumpy, because uh, it's, get it? <laughs> it's Bumpy. <laughs> and then there's this alternate rendering of the Blotto paint worklet, which I showed you earlier, but with just sort of a larger radius on the circles with a blend mode applied to give it a sort of ink blot gone wild effect. Uh, that's kind of cool. Um, and then there's, yeah, this blend mode just kind of makes them like sort of overlay each other. I think it uses multiply. Uh, and then I started getting a little bit wackier and came up with this one which I like to call Bitemare. Um, and even though it looks 3D, it's really just a 2D drawing. Um, I don't think you can use a 3D context in paint worklets yet. Um, I use some trigonometry functions just to kind of fake that 3D look, and I think it's pretty convincing. And in that same vein, here's my favorite one I made so far, which I call Parallela Wow. Um, <laughs> it also uses a little trig to fake that 3D thing again. And I don't know, who knows where I'll go with, with this next. This is just the last one I made that I like, uh, but it's a lot of fun. And if you're looking to know how I did some of these or where you can find that code, I have a little surprise for you at the end of this talk. Um, but we got some other stuff to talk about first. Okay, so we had some fun there for a minute, right? Like, it was a wild ride. But the problem with paint worklets, as I've described them, is that they're just not, well, very flexible. Well, as I've described them, uh, you just ha you have to change the paint worklet code itself to change its appearance. And while that can work, it's not very convenient and, and really just kind of a pain. What if you wanted to reuse that same worklet code in different places on the same site? What if you wanted, to do, wanted it to do basically the same thing but adapt it to different contexts solely by tweaking its appearance in CSS? That'd be cool, right? Well, guess what? That is possible. You can, set, you can set up your paint worklets so that their appearance can be altered by what are called custom CSS properties that you, that you define that are relevant to your paint worklet. And this feature is not a part of the CSS Paint API, but rather another feature called the, the custom properties or maybe just properties and values API. Seriously. So let's go back to the CSS for the flashy paint worklet example from earlier. Um, what would the CSS for this look like if we could customize an aspect of its appearance through a custom property? Kind of something like this, like if, what if we wanted to control the size of the, of the sun's radius, right, to make that circle bigger if we wanted to? Um, 
Well, the, the property starting with double dashes is a custom property. And when we set custom CSS properties on elements using a paint worklet, we can access those values within that paint worklet. And now this is where the power and practicality lies with this technology, because if a paint worklet's rendering can't be influenced by anything outside of the worklet code itself, you'd have to change your worklet code every freaking time you wanted it to do something different, or you'd have to make multiple versions of that same worklet in order to customize its appearance in CSS, and that's just wasteful. Custom properties help us to make paint worklets infinitely more useful and reusable. And they're like the hook in a good song, that like just in a really good banging song that just makes it even better. So the next step is to use a little thing called the Properties and Values API to establish the identity and shape of a custom property, property in your application JavaScript, like you would put this on the main thread in your app code. And even though it's not strictly necessary to do this, it's not a bad idea for a few reasons. For one, you can control what the data type is for the custom property via the syntax setting. In this case, you can see that we're specifying the property's value as an integer. The value we set here is called a CSS syntax string, and it helps the API to enforce what's considered a valid value for a given custom property. And two, we can decide whether or not the value for this property can be inherited by child elements using the inherits option. I haven't found exactly where this is useful yet for paint worklets, but I'm sure it's there somewhere. I mean, it's, it's specified. I'm sure it's useful. And three, we decide what the property's default value should be via the initial value option if that property is unspecified. So that's kind of useful because properties have defaults that just sort of kick in if you don't specify them. So we can do the same thing with our custom properties. So what does it look like when you want paint worklets to access those custom property values? Um, it's not too onerous, really. It's just a two-step process. The first is to add a static getter method to your worklet class called input properties, uh, which returns an array of all the custom properties that we've registered. And then in the worklet, we can access these properties through a third argument in the paint method uh, signature uh, called properties, unsurprisingly. Uh, the arguments get method allows access to the custom property values passed in CSS. Uh, here you can see that we like we pull it and then we cast it to an int. I don't think the property properties and values API is at can candidate recommendations, so that might actually not be the final code for what that looks like. Um, uh, but then we get it in there, and then at this point we can then control the paint worklet's presentation entirely with CSS. And what we can achieve with this is super duper powerful. When we parameterize paint worklets, we make them customizable in ways we didn't even think was possible. And here you can see that we can dynamically change the tile size of, of the Blotto worklet's uh, output. Like we can, um, we can change the color as well as other influential properties like the amplitude, the maximum opa opacity, like the blend modes and stuff. It's pretty cool. We can make them fit practically anywhere, and that's the beauty of generative artwork applied in this context. It's one thing to generate art with JavaScript. We've been doing that for a long time. It's an entirely different thing to control it in this fashion. Um, and you can do it without having to tweak more than a couple properties. So now that I've showed you all the cool stuff, um, it's time I inform you of the un unfortunate uh, yet entirely predictable reality that you must eat your vegetables. By which I mean, it's time to tell, your paint, to tell you that paint worklets don't have solid browser support. Um, and that, therefore, that means you must treat them as a progressive enhancement. And you'll need a backup plan, right? So that's a lot of what we do on the web is feel like my official title is like backup plan guy <laughs> for everything. <laughs> Furthermore, because paint worklets are JavaScript, you need that backup plan even in browsers that do support them. So support isn't terrible for the Paint API when you look at the bigger picture. In fact, it's only one, it's the only part of Houdini that currently is at the candidate recommendation stage, um, at least at the time of this table's rendering. But support for it just isn't universal, so you need to know how to adapt. And that said, you shouldn't have to break your back to provide a fallback, because CSS itself can usually solve this. The thing to remember about resiliency uh, when, when using the CSS Paint API is that the order in which we specify CSS properties matters, and that is what is going to save you. Going this route is usually enough for a fallback. Browsers that understand this API will use the second rule. Um, 
but those that don't will fall back to the first occurrence of, a, of that rule that they consider to be valid. And in this case, a browser like, say, Firefox, which doesn't support paint worklets yet, but it's coming, uh, will fall back to the first rule. And most of the time, this approach is enough. The idea is that your fallback should resemble the paint worklet like somewhat, right? It doesn't usually have to be much more than an approximation because it's, it's pretty rare that like somebody would see both renderings of like the fallback and the paint worklet itself like next to each other. Uh, so to illustrate, this is my personal website in Chrome with a paint worklet used in the backgrounds of different sections. It's just like that kind of slapdash paint worklet that I had. Uh, and now here it is in a browser that doesn't. And it's not exactly the same, uh, but it's a reasonable like kind of approximation and it works well enough. And just be sure that you're optimizing your fallback images. That's the perf guy within me just can't help but tell you to do that. Um, if possible, try to create like tileable smaller patterns to keep those fallback images as small as possible because simple paint worklets will usually be, be smaller over the wire uh, than images. Now for another question. What if a paint worklet just like fails to load for whatever reason? And this is where promises are your friend. You might recall that in order to load a paint worklet, we have access to a promise when it completely loads or conversely when it fails to load. Um, and in this case, we can compensate for this in the promises catch method, uh, which executes if the promise was rejected, in this case, if the paint worklet failed to load for some reason. And if it does fail, we can add a class to the body element, which we can then target with CSS to provide a fallback. Um, that CSS would look something like this, although that's a little weird. I said body element, so work with me with that inconsistency. Imagine it was applied to the element itself uh, instead. In the event that the paint worklet fails to load, we would still get a fallback background image that we can still use. And it's important to note that at least in Chrome, if a paint worklet fails to load, the CSS only fallback for non-supporting browsers described earlier will not kick in. Uh, because that it still considers that paint syntax to be a valid value, but that worklet hasn't loaded. So you have to have a more specific rule to make that work. Uh, so you'll need to provide an explicit fallback. Otherwise, you just, you'll just won't have a background at all. OK. Most of the talks I give are about performance. And I thought maybe I could get through this one without any perf talk, but I was wrong. It turns out that there's a couple things to keep in mind when it comes to keeping your paint worklets fast as well as being considerate with what, with what can be a rather taxing API if it's not used carefully. Because if you don't, you risk making the internet more like this for people. So let's avoid that and talk about what you can do to make paint worklets work as optimally as they can. Because of their restricted scope, paint worklets won't often be very large. The ones I've written usually end up being less than two kilobytes before compression. Um, but if you can help it, do not run your paint worklets through Babel. That is no-nos, no. So let's look at the impact as an example that Babel transforms have by taking the circuitry worklet from the beginning of this talk. Even when it's unuglified, it's very small, and it also works in every browser that supports paint worklets without Babel's help. Paint worklets do not need to be transformed in order for them to work. Now here's that same worklet after Babel transforms it. And if you can't read this code, that's kind of the point. There's a lot of cruft here, which affects parsing, compilation, and execution time. And the omnipresent question of web development seems to inevitably be, should this work in every browser? And in this case, there are two answers, no and hell no. The, um, the paint worklets aren't supported in all modern browsers yet. So we don't need to treat them with the web compatibility mindset that we clung to in the 2000s. If you must must. If you must process paint worklets with Babel, perhaps out of a matter of convenience and I can understand, ensure you know how to configure it to minimize transforms. I tend to avoid including them in the asset graph of any bundler until I know they'll be able to process them the way I expect. And this last piece of perf advice I have is to be considerate of your users, particularly mobile ones. Not everyone has a Pixel 3 or a 2018 MacBook Pro that can obliterate whatever comes down the rendering pipeline without turning into a fully functioning panini grill. So when paint worklets draw in normal scenarios, such as on load or when the orientation of the device changes, they can be resource intensive, but not ludicrously so. But that does not mean that even though worklets do their work off the main thread, like web workers, that they can't impact page responsiveness. This screenshot is from a performance profiling session where a browser was continuously resizing and a paint worklet was redrawing every time. 
Um, they, worklets will redraw any time the dimensions of their container change or if CSS properties on that container change. So please resist the temptation to like do stuff like make them redraw constantly to like make them like animate inefficiently or otherwise for no real sensible reason. And additionally, make a call on when it's not appropriate to use these things. We can't look at the device's battery level since the battery status API is no longer a thing, but we do have another signal we can look at, and that is the device memory API, the amount of memory that, the approximate amount of memory that the device has. And as usual, it's not supported everywhere, but checking for support is as trivial as seeing if navigator.device memory is defined, and if it is, we can get the coarse amount of memory. And here we've decided that if a device has at least uh, four gigabytes or more of memory will register that paint worklet, and then we can, or otherwise we can like do the class hook where we decide to f go to a fallback. Um, and in any case, if you're concerned that any part of your paint worklet code is inefficient in any way, if you profile in Chrome DevTools in the performance profiler, and then after that go to the sources tab, you can see the impact of each line, like how much execution time, and then you can just decide whether or not that you want to address any suboptimal behavior if you can. Well, it's that time. But before I properly part from you all, I want to call out a few resources I think are well worth your time. First off, uh, Yuna Krivets has been jamming on paint worklets for a long time. And if you feel like my quick intro to the technology just didn't cut it for you, I understand, then Yuna's article on the, on the API just cannot fail you. She is just is superb at describing these things. And secondly, Sam Richards did a more broadly scoped talk on Houdini in general last year at CSS Conf AU. Some of what he's talked about there may have changed a bit since uh, as Houdini is evolving, but it's still a great talk for anyone who wants to know more about this awesome set of APIs that are coming down the pike. Um, and now remember when I said there was a surprise? Here it is. If you're interested in seeing an open source showcase of the paint worklets I've written, uh, you can check out a site I've made called Paintlets. Um, it's paintlets.herokuapp.com, but I got a little tiny URL thing there, um, and I'll post the slide deck later. Uh, this will show each paint worklet and its custom properties, so you can experiment with each one, and they're free to download. You can just use them if you want. I don't care if you credit them, I don't care what you do with them. Um, and plus, each paint worklet, oh, yeah, yeah, I just said that, so. <laughs> and if you have a paint worklet that you've written uh, that you think is pretty cool, I welcome you to submit a pull request to the repo or just show it to me and I can, and I can pull it in for you because I'm kind of picky about how that gets done. So if, if you'd like, want that, cool, let's, let's talk. There's, I'll post this, you'll know where this is all at pretty soon. And of course, at the time, I thought I was being a clever little shit when I wrote Paintlets, but it unsurprisingly turns out that someone had the same idea and before I did, and that person was not surprisingly um, Yuna Krivets. So if you want a different take on the idea, check out her extra.css site. Has some cool things that you can check out and pull into your project as well. And with that, I thank you for your time, your interest, your everlasting love of all things web, which gives me no shortage of hope and admiration for this community and for welcoming me into your amazingly beautiful and historically awesome city. Um, here are my slides, which will be available at that URL um, hopefully shortly, if I can get the Wi-Fi thing figured out. And uh, thank you all so very, very much. That was great. <laughs>